Good morning, everybody. Glad to have you with me this morning on a Sunday morning, 10 a.m. here, Central Time in Texas. We're going to get into some deep stuff this morning, so I want you to hold right in there with me and don't, uh, don't judge me. Just open up your mind, your heart, and we're going to talk this morning. If, if I were to put a title on this, I, I'm hesitant to do this, but I'm going to title this, You Are the Word Made Flesh. You are the Word made flesh. I will start over in John chapter 10 and verse 10, which is a very familiar verse of Scripture to all of us that have been in church any length of time. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief comes, but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Then he gives a, a, a comparison. He said, but I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now stay with me this morning. We're going to unwind this. We're going to deep dive into some things. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Now if you come back to chapter 9, verse 46, on through chapter 10, about verse 19, you'll see that Jesus was talking directly to the Pharisees. Not, not to them individually, although they were represented individually. He's speaking to the pharisaical form of religion from chapter 9 verse 46 down to about chapter 10 verse 19. He's talking to the Pharisees and once in a while people ask me why, why I'm so hard on the evangelicals. I'm not hard on evangelical people. I'm tough on the system because I have seen what the system has done in the lives of people. It has, it has stolen, it has killed life, it has it has destroyed everything that Jesus came when he talked about abundant life. The evangelical system, I could plug that in instead of the Pharisees, stealing, killing, and destroying. Now, when you get down to verse 10, when he says that the devil or the thief, I <laughs> see there's no religious slip. When the thief comes to kill, to steal, to destroy, there's no reference to the devil. We tag that on there. We tag that on there, and we used it as a verse many times for like spiritual warfare, casting the devil out. The thief that he's talking about is the pharisaical form of religion, the law. The law comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy all of the joy and the life that Jesus came to bring to all humanity. You remember back to the pronouncement of the angels in Luke chapter 2, where the angel says, I've come with good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Jesus came to flesh that out and to demonstrate it. The religious form of that day and the religious form of this day steals, kills, and destroys that, that good tidings turned into bad tidings. It has, it has killed and stolen and destroyed everything that Jesus talked about or had reference to when he talks about uh, the life that he came to bring us. So what they brought upon people still is ringing true today. It's heavy burdens, heavy loads that minister death. In fact, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 7. He said, but if the ministry of death... Paul calls this a ministry of death that was written and engraved in stone. So what, what's the ministry of death he's talking about? He's talking about the law. He said, if you think that was glorious, so that people couldn't even look on the face of Moses because of the glory, he says in verse 8, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? So Jesus came to give us something that superseded what Paul called, and I think this is so apropos, he called it the ministry of death that was engraven in stone. Then Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, that the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Life in verse 10 that Jesus talks about that he came to bring to us originates and it is sustained, listen to me, it originates and it is sustained by God. It's his very breath. It's, it's everything that he imparted to man. When God created man, he blew into his nostrils. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. He sets that little clay guy up and breathes into his nostrils. And when, he, when God breathes into man, 
He's imparting, he's imputing, he's dispensing everything that he is. Everything that the father was, was imputed and given to man. So man was finally complete. Without that breath, man is not complete. But when God blew into man the breath of life, he became a complete being, spirit, soul, and body. So our, our very life, the life that we live, the, the life that I'm you know, demonstrating in front of you is actually the very breath of the creator making us what he is. Now stay with me. I'm not, I'm not entering into some blasphemy here. His breath imparted to us, given to us, makes us what he is. In fact, the scripture says this, the spirit of God has made me and the breath of the almighty gives me life. That's a direct quote from your book. And I might add that was given pre-cross. What I'm getting at this morning in this, in this little introduction, when Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, the word life there is, of course, the word Zoe. It's the God kind of life, which was given to us in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And that's what sustains us. Now, what that does, that makes every human a divine chip off the old block. That's an old expression. Chip off the, we're a chip off the old block. We're just like our dad. Now, we are not the block. Don't confuse me this morning. Don't confuse what I'm saying this morning. We're not the block. But we certainly are a chip off the old block. The life in you is the breath. In the Greek, it's the word pneuma. It means wind or uh, breath. It's, it's the essence of the creator himself that he has given to all of us. Your life, listen, your life is God manifesting himself in the flesh. The firstborn among all of us, the firstborn among many brothers demonstrated who we are and he walked it out on the planet. That was one of the reasons that Jesus came. I think there's two primary reasons Jesus really came. Number one was to give us an accurate picture of the father, who he really was, to dispel all of the, the wrong notions, the wrong pictures, uh, some of the, the prophets gave were not exactly op uh, accurate. They were looking through a glass darkly. They were looking through a glass dimly. They didn't have good revelation. So the father says, I'm, I need to come down there so they can see me in flesh form. So Jesus is Emmanuel. He's God with us. In Colossians 2.9, it says, in Jesus, in this one human being, dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily, which is powerful. And you weren't excluded from the party. You were, you were included in that, that, the word perichoresis, that circle dance that the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit enjoy in union with distinction, but they're in total union. You're included into that circle. And in verse 10 of Colossians chapter 2, where, where verse 9 says that in Jesus dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily, verse 10 says, and you are complete in him. Now, without being in him, I'm not complete. Aren't you glad that he put you in Christ before the foundation of the world so that you could become increasingly aware of the completeness that you carry because of the breath, the life that God himself has imparted and given to us? It's his life that makes us complete in him, spirit, soul, and body. Let me say it like this. Let me say it like this, without our awareness of this life, without our awareness of this breath, we're not living the abundant life that Jesus came to bring us. He said in John 10, 10, I've come that you might have the life of God. I've come that you might become increasingly aware of who you actually are. And here I am to demonstrate what that life actually looks like. Remember back in Genesis chapter 1, let me just give you a little, little background on that. Most of you know this. In Genesis 1, 26, 7, and 8, God said, let us make man. That was the word of God. Let us make man, his word. He said, let him have dominion and, and let him, let's make him in our image and likeness. And the word our, that's in, in plural, in the image of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. You're, you're in that image. But until we get to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that image and likeness has no life. That image and likeness has no life until he blows into it the breath of life. So you died. The new creation is, is something spectacular. 
You, you died. This awareness, the increasing awareness that we have of who we are brings about not a physical death or spiritual death, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a lessening awareness of our humanness and an increasing awareness of who God actually created us to be. What's going on in the world today is an absolute awakening to the spirit of truth inspired revelation of who we actually are. And it's getting larger and it's getting bigger. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to stay ahead of that curve without getting too far ahead of it. Because if you get too far ahead of what the spirit of truth is revealing to us, uh, people globally, then it becomes like, man, I can't, I don't, this guy's kind of gone off the deep end. But as he moves us as a body, as he moves us as a people, it creates a desire in us to see more life, to experience more life, to, to have more light, more revelation, to walk in more love. It just generates itself perpetually as, as we're being created or as, as we're beginning to experience in our awareness the Christ that is within us. So he is by grace transforming us and he's supercharging this new creation that we actually are step by step from glory to glory, here a little, there a little. And it just continually adds to the awareness and the perception and the consciousness that the spirit of truth is bringing to all. Now, this is what happened to the disciples after the resurrection. This is a very key scripture. I, I read this, I don't know how many times. I, I'm quoting some scriptures this morning that I read, I don't know, hundreds of times as a, as a good pastor. And I never saw these things until I was awakened. And that's, that's what's going on today. We're awakening. So we're seeing things we never saw. You read your Bible, you see things you never uh, perceived before. You, you're in your quiet time. There are things that are beginning to drop into your spirit and arise within you that you, you go, wow, I, why didn't I see that before? Now, here's what happened to the disciples after the resurrection. And this is what's taking place right here today. John chapter 20. And let me read, let me read just verses 21 to 23. John chapter 20, verse 21. Read through verse 23. Now, this is after the resurrection. Jesus is appearing to the disciples, and he said to them, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I send you. Now, that's a, we could spend all morning on that one verse in exploring how equipped, how powerful the Father sent Jesus to meet every obstacle, every need, everything that he encountered. He was able to bring the kingdom into that situation. He said, in that same way, I'm sending you. <clears throat> and when he had said this, now this is what's going to equip them. This comes an awakening. Watch. And when he had said this, he breathed. Does that sound familiar? Genesis 2, 7. God breathed into man the breath of life. Now Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Didn't ask him uh, to have faith for it. Didn't ask him to pray a prayer for it. Didn't say they had to respond. Didn't say they had to receive it. He just said, here it is. Receive it. It's imputed. It's given to you. Now, this, this is powerful, and I'm not going to stay on this 23rd verse, but here's what it equipped them to do. This is what it has equipped you to do. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. Do you ever notice that Jesus, before the cross, actually was forgiving the sins of people? And there is a pronouncement that you and I can come. Thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You and I need to pronounce over people See, the sin there is missing the mark. When people encounter the killing, the stealing, and the destroying, they're basically essentially missing the mark of the abundant life that Jesus gave. So what you and I need to do, we need to pronounce freedom from the missing of the mark. We need to direct them to the mark. In one place, Paul called it the ministry of reconciliation. Now, let me come back to John chapter 20. Here's what I want you to see. That breath that Jesus breathed on them, he breathed out of himself what he was. And you and I today can breathe out of, the, out of the breath of who we are into situations and circumstances, into the lives of people that have needs. That breath was the life that awakened them to who they had always been from Genesis 2-7 but didn't know it. 
So Jesus comes and he opens their eyes. Now this is, this is absolutely important for what's going to take place in just a few days. This was imperative for Jesus taught them from, from the time that he resurrected to the time he ascended. So in, in John chapter 20, Jesus breathes on them, their eyes open, and they received the, the, the spirit of, of truth that he promised they would have. They, become, they became aware of it. He didn't give them anything that they didn't already have. Just like today, there's nothing that we can get that we don't already have. It's a matter of awakening to it. It's a matter of seeing it. It's a matter of allowing the spirit of truth to unveil it. And Jesus opened their eyes so that in Acts chapter 1, he could, he could now speak to them about things that up to this time they had absolutely no clue of. Let me read Acts chapter 1, just the first three verses. The writer of Acts says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus, of all that Jesus, began to both do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, watch, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he had uh, presented himself alive by suffering many infallible proofs, being seen of them for 40 days. So they were totally quickened. They were totally alive. Now here's what he did. For 40 days, he was speaking, the end of verse 3, he was speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. John 20, he awakens them. John 20, he breathes on them. The spirit of truth comes alive. Their eyes open. They're awakened. So that in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, for 40 days, man, I would like to have CDs of that. Wouldn't you like to have a book on that seminar? 40 days, Jesus, the master teacher, greatest teacher of all time, teaches the apostles about the things of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> now, you never understand the kingdom until you're awakened. A lot of talk about the kingdom in church. Sometimes the kingdom is put off to the return of Jesus and, or the, the, the rapture, whatever. That's not what Jesus was teaching them. That's the problem today. Many don't see the kingdom here and now because they're not awakened. You at the Digital Cathedral are awakening, if you haven't already awakened, to the reality of the kingdom today. There's so many forms of godliness today that do not see the power of God in operation in the kingdom. Now, with that in mind, look, look, look at the progression here. Jesus awakens them, then he teaches them about the things of the kingdom. Let's go back to John chapter 3 in that conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. Jesus said this, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom, unless he's enlightened, unless he's awakened. And you have been. Remember, uh, what is it? First Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 says that we were born again. I think in, in the King James or New King James says, and we were begotten through the resurrection. Every one of us were born again. Our eyes were opened to the, the potential. And now, we, now we're getting the scales off. Now we are with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We're being changed into the same image from glory to glory. We're starting to see things clearly. Things are, that were mysteries, we're starting to understand them a whole lot better than we've ever understood them before. And it's because of what Jesus did in John 20, breathed on them, received the Holy Spirit, taught them the things pertaining to the kingdom. I can bring that right in to September of 2023. Eyes are opening. We're beginning to see the reality of the kingdom. We're beginning to understand that we are the word made flesh, Genesis 1, 26, 7, and 8, God said his word, and then in the second chapter, seventh verse, he breathed into man. That word then became a living, a living being, absolutely complete. You are not created with flaws and defects. God doesn't create junk. I don't care what they told you down at the church house. God does not create defective people. He creates people in his image and his likeness that are endued with the very life that Jesus said, I've come to give you, but we got to get rid of the killing, the stealing, and the destroying that the religious law, 
the rules and regulations, all the hoops that you've been told you got to jump through to gain favor with God. We got to get rid of all that so that He can breathe on you and awaken you. Then you can learn about the things of the kingdom. That's what He was telling Nicodemus except you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom. How are we awakened? Listen closely. You're awakened as the life of God that has always been in you, as that begins to stir, as it begins to gin in there, as it begins to move. Uh, a lady this week messaged me and said, man, I am, I am seeing things. She said, it started five years ago, and I begin to see things I'd never seen before. I, I, I was visiting with a lady at the gym today that she, she read my book, Hell's Illusion. She said, you just put into words what I had seen internally. I, I, I knew, I knew down to my knower exactly what you were saying, but I couldn't put words to it. Now, if you just let that crock pot, you'll get to where you, you can express it with words very accurately. But you'll go through a time as he awakens you, as you see the kingdom. You might not be able to express it in words. That's fine. You don't have to go out and say anything. You don't have to stand on the hood of your car down at the pizza shop and start preaching uh, what you're seeing. <laughs> you don't have to do that. You don't have to pass out chick tracks, uh, turn to burn tracks. You just let it, let it, what I call crock pot. And as it crock pots, it takes root. It takes, and it begins to grow within you until you can begin to express exactly what you're seeing. And it's good, man. It, it is continually going. It's, it's part of his plan to impute everything to us in our awakening. Peter said that we have been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. So if you've already got it, then it's only a matter of fact of becoming aware of it. And that's what's taking place in your life today. This life is designed as we awaken to its reality and we operate in the wholeness of life today on this planet. Romans chapter 8. Let me give you a little bit more scripture this morning. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Hope I'm, hope I'm ringing the bell this morning. You are the Word made flesh. Jesus was the Word made flesh. You're a chip off the old block. You're a partaker of the divine nature. You're just like your daddy. Your daddy is not the devil. Your father was never the devil. He had nowhere to go to, to get life to make you alive under his control and dominion. You have never been a product of the devil. You, have never, you, you might have been enslaved in your mind and you experienced the killing, the stealing, and the destroying that religion brought to you. Let me tell you something. It was not the devil. It, it was the Pharisees in this time's manifestation, which is the evangelical church. And most every one of us were part of the evangelical church. I need to always put the caveat in. I'm not upset with evangelical people. It's the system that needs to fall. It's the bondage that needs to be freed from. God bless the people. So many sincere people love Jesus. But all they're, all they're feeding on is what has been paired to them through confirmational biasness week after week after week, month after month, year after year, until we, we bought the lie hook, line, and sinker. So when you hear the truth, <laughs> the truth, you believe the lie, even though the truth sounds better. All right, let's talk about this life. Romans chapter 8. And verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and it does, the spirit that raised the power of that spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will give life. He's going to empower you with divine life. That's what that word life means right there. It's the divine life. He empowers you with that divine life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now let this just sink in a little bit. If the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, now that, that spirit that is within you is going to start to do a work. It, it's going to work in you whether you recognize it or not. And at some point you will recognize it. 
He who raised Christ from the dead will also give divine life to your mortal body. Now we got a problem there because we're we've always been expecting that this mortal body is going to vanish. He's giving divine life to it. He's empowering with divine life. So what what are we saying there? No, notice it says mortal life. Divine power will give life to your mortal life. It's a it's a that's the life that we were told you live three score and ten. If you're not satisfied, you can live eighty years, right? Another ten. But the divine life that he has empowered you with has no beginning and it has no end. It's his life. It's not subject. The the life that he has given to you through the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and it dwells in you has put life within you that does not know mortality. If, if that's true, and I believe Paul was right on the money, if that's true, then the only life that we will have is the life that you now possess. So I've had to repent, which means change my mind. I was going this direction. I've got to go this direction. I repented and changed my life, my mind, to now see my life, and I want you to see your life in the same way. I now see my life as God sees it. There's no end to it. It's immortal. It cannot vanish. It cannot, it cannot pass away. Now we trust drugs. We trust therapy. We trust change of environments. But he's pulling us into his very life. He's already pulled us in. He's already pulled us in. But we, we need to get our, our minds acclimated to what he has already done. All right, come down to verse 13. Same, same chapter. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you die. If you go to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that does not feed your life. The, the tree of dualism, the tree of twos. You eat on that, that's what Adam and Eve ate on. He said, you're, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, be, you're gonna die. That means you're not connected. You've, you're, you're not getting the full impact of the life that is within you. But if you by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You experience the life of God. So we're, we're learning to strengthen the Spirit. We're learning to go within, hear the Spirit. We're learning to give right away to the Spirit. And that's energizing us. That is energizing you with a divine life. You are the Word made flesh, my friend. And now we're realizing where the source of life actually comes from. So when you take the Spirit and you move to the tree of life, you put to death the deeds that have come from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's pretty clear. Right? You, you will die. There will be a, a, a mortal end. But when you put to deeds the death that has caused those, that mortal limitation, then you will live. Here's how Jesus looked at it. Now, that, when I say look at your life like Jesus, like Jesus looks at it, here's how Jesus looked at his life. Are you ready? John chapter 11. You're probably going to need to go back and listen to this a couple times. I want you to get the full impact of it because we're, we're moving it up a notch this morning. We're moving it up a notch. I'm, I'm unveiling some things. I'm unpacking some things that I think is absolutely imperative for this point in your development. Now, here's how Jesus saw his life. John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he will live. Though he may die, he will live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, in that 25th, 26th verse, I read this all of my life. I never saw this. There's, there's a comparison here that I want you to get. I want you to change from one dimension to the next. He said in verse 25, <clears throat> I am the resurrection and the life. I've come that you might have life, have it more abundantly. You're now being awakened. You're being quickened to that which is within you, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And he says, he who believes in me, Though he may die, he will live because that life that is within you knows no death. So ultimately, it will take its precedence. But then in verse 26, he draws a distinction. And he said, whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Now, which, which one do you want? 
Jesus is really laying out a choice here. Which, which one do you want? He said, I am the resurrection and life. Not, not going to be the resurrection and life. I am the resurrection and life. Can you say that about yourself? Can you say, I am the resurrection and the life? That's another way of saying, not only do I believe in him, I live in him. He who believes in me and lives in me will never die. You might walk from the, from the kitchen into the dining room, but that's just a change in levels of consciousness. Our, our repentance, here's where our repentance needs to be. Change of mind. It's to leave our limited, natural way of thinking and to use the mind of Christ that has been given to us and the mind of Christ in Jesus, they were inseparable. Jesus only functioned out of the mind of Christ. You, you can come and you, you, you're at a place where you can function fully out of the mind of Christ. That's the tree of life. That's what the tree of life says. Now here's, here's what Jesus he just got done in John chapter 11, verse 26. Whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Now, here's, here's how Jesus saw it. John chapter 10. We just read verse 10, and he keeps talking in John 10. And when we come down to verse 17, here's what Jesus said. Here's how Jesus saw his life. He saw it the same way the Father did. Therefore, my th Father loves me because I lay my life down that I may take it up again. Not only did he have the power to lay it down, he had the power to take it up again. I think personally that Paul experienced that. Paul lived in that. Remember when Paul was stoned? You didn't stone somebody and leave them breathing. You, you stoned them until they were <laughs> stone cold dead. And the last stone that was thrown in a stoning was someone would take a large rock and go over and just drop it on the head, crush the skull to ensure the death. And after Paul was stoned, he got back up and walked back into town. Jesus said, no, I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. No, so he says in verse 13, nobody takes it from me. No person, no disease, no sickness, no peril. I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. This command I have received from the Father. Jesus didn't come up with this on his own. Because he didn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He only ate from the tree of life. The Father revealed that to Jesus, that that's how he could live. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever visualized yourself empowered to say what the prototype son said? He came in every way to show you how to live out this life. I realize I'm, I'm, I'm plowing up ground this morning. I realize I'm maybe pouring some new wine into that wine skin. Have you ever thought, I don't need to change levels of consciousness. I don't need to lay this body down until I am fully, well, I feel an anointing on that, until I am fully convinced and satisfied that I have completed the race. I have done everything that I need to do. I'm not dying an early death. I'm not dying from sickness and disease. I'm going to lay my life down when the time comes. No man, no sickness, no disease is a, is a match for, nor can it overcome the Zoe, the life of God, the abundant life that Jesus came to give you, which you've been awakened to, like the disciples were in John 20, the life that the Father breathed into every one of us to make us as he is, the very essence. There's nothing on the earth that is powerful enough to snuff that life out. Now, when that thought matures, and that thought really develops within, then we will speak like Jesus speaks, say, nobody's taking my life from me. You're convinced of it. I'm not going to die sick. You're convinced of it. In John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus said, The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. They're pneuma and they're zoe. He's always speaking. The Father's always speaking. He's always talking to us. Our, our Father's a, a little 
chatty box. He's, he's always communing with us. The communication from the Father to us is, is never cut. The communication is never cut. Now, here's what we do. We create static when we live from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When you live from that, that dualistic tree of twos, the, what you think is right and wrong, what you think is good and evil, the tree of self-determination, I'm going to decide where I go, how I do it. <clears throat> and then most of us have asked God to bless what we've already set our mind to do. Jesus didn't live that way. What that does, it creates static in the communication line. He's still speaking. But because of the determinations we've made, the decisions we've made, it becomes increasingly difficult to hear what he says because of the, 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 the static, and I don't, I'm not sure what other word to use, the noise that we've introduced into that line of communication. Jesus had absolute power and confidence in the words that he spoke because he didn't eat ever from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. How could Jesus hear the Father so clearly? Because he only ate from the tree of life. How do I know that? Here's, here again, this is where you're manifesting as a son. Here's where we're moving from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And boy, I tell you what, there's a path being beaten from that tree <clears throat> to the tree of life. And it becomes very evident that you're eating from the right tree. When you, like Jesus, can say only what the Father says, and only do what you see the Father do. Now, I'm not talking about Bible speak. I'm not talking about get a bunch of scriptures and just uh, keep confessing them. I've been there, done that. Stayed the night, got the t-shirt. That I'm not, I thank God for those days because it put it helped me to remember scripture. But that's not the power, that's not, that's not the influence that you're looking for. You can be eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and be confessing scriptures. As we say in Texas, tell the cows come home. And it's not going to change your life one iota. That's, that's why word and faith people, God bless them, they get a scripture, they stand on the promise, but they don't hear what the Father is saying to them. The real promises that count are the words that the Father speaks to you. Remember, over in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide asunder soul from spirit. Now, the, the Word of God that he's talking about is not the Bible. The Bible never one place calls itself the Word of God. The Word of God is the Word that he speaks from his lips to your ears. Probably not, not these ears, but the ears that are within. And when he speaks that word to you, he's going to show you dividing soul and spirit. The soul is what eats from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. He's going to show you what is of spirit, what he's speaking to you in your inner man, what he's, what he's speaking to you deep within. He may be speaking things this morning that your head's having trouble with. See, your head wants to pull you back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Your, your head wants to pull you back to that tree of logic, self-determination. There are things that you may be hearing this morning that you believe, but your head hasn't caught up yet. You lead with your spirit. You lead with your inner man. You lead with what you sense within. And if you keep on that path, your head will actually catch up with it, what's going on inside, and you'll begin to act as he speaks to you, whether you feel it or don't feel it. Whether you feel or don't feel it is inconsequential. But a lot of times you're not moved by your feelings. See, your feelings are back over to the wrong tree again. Words that you as a son speak are come within, and you believe that they're going to make a difference. Now, don't, don't be speaking them until... You know within that you know that you know this is the Father speaking to me. So what do, I, what do we speak? We speak words of praise. We speak words of thanksgiving. We speak words like Jesus said at the tomb of Lazarus, Father, I thank you that you always hear me. You're confident in this very thing that he that began a good work in you is going to continue it. You're confident that it is he uh, who started everything. It's God that works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. 
See, your loss, your life is now lost in Christ, in God. It's no longer I who live, it's Christ that lives in me. See, all those things begin to, to become real to us. All the confessions that Jesus made about I am, they came out of what the Father disclosed to him about who he was. That's why they're so, they were so powerful. He didn't just come up with the idea, I'm the bread of life. He didn't come up with the idea, I am the resurrection and the life. He didn't, he didn't come up with those things. The Father disclosed them, which enabled him to say, the Father and I are one. Are you sensing within that this is where the Spirit of Truth is bringing you to where you're now absolutely aware there's no separation between you and the Father? Never has been. But now we've come to that point where we're understanding we've been fully reconciled. We're in full union. Doesn't mean you are him. It means that you are enjoying and living the life that he gave you, which is his life, but it's with distinction. You will never be him. He will never be you. He made you unique. He made your personnel, he made your likes, your dislikes, so that he could begin to manifest on the earth and make earth as it is in heaven. I mean, Jesus changed the visible with the invisible. That's how Jesus created. <clears throat> he got thoughts from the mind of Christ. And I, I need to take four or five Sundays and just go through all this. Jesus took thoughts from the mind of Christ, which you need to do. And he began to paint in his imagination as the Father did. Let us make man in our image and likeness. The man wasn't breathing. Man wasn't there yet. Father saw it, said, let us do this. He saw it in his imagination, painted it extremely clear, dropped into his heart until it grew. Seed in the garden grows on good ground, produces 30, 60, 100 fold. When it gets into your heart, then you begin to speak it. The solution to your problem, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start winding this down this morning. I might be just a touch quick today. I'm not going to keep you 50 minutes. The solution to your problem, the healing of an illness, does not depend on your striving. It's not dependent on your faith. It's not dependent on you confessing scripture. It comes from, and man, if you hear nothing else I'm saying this morning, listen to me. It comes when you start taking your focus off the problem. And you start to get centered upon thanksgiving and the blessing that the Father of all benefits has given to you. Letting, letting the possession that we have, as Peter said, of all things, you, you already possess what it is that you spend hours on your knees crying to ball and squalling to God. You've already got the answer. The mind of Christ will begin to reveal it. And you create that picture in your imagination. As, as detailed as you can get it. Then you begin to speak. When that matures, then you begin to speak words of life, spirit and life, just like Jesus saw. He that will, let him come to the waters of life and let him drink freely. Amen? All right, all of you that are the word made flesh, chips off the old block, changing our thinking, changing our style of life as the spirit leads us and teaches us and brings revelation to us until we fully walk as he walked on this planet. Amen? All right, see you Wednesday night. I think that's as far as we want to go this morning. See you Wednesday night, Secret Place, back next Sunday uh, here at the Digital Cathedral. Invite a friend or two. Some of you are beginning to open up your living rooms on Sunday morning and uh, show this on your big screen TV. If you have a smart TV, you can just go to YouTube and you can watch it on your big screen TV without any problem at all. So invite some friends over, have some coffee and donuts. And when I'm done here, you can discuss it, talk about it, maybe go out to lunch together. I don't know. But there are pockets and pools of people that are beginning to gather all over the country and some of countries outside the United States. Once I've got some exciting things I'm going to start to share with you next next week about that very thing. But we'll get there when we get there. But there's some good things happening. Some doors that are opening that I want you to be aware of and make the journey with me. Amen. See you next week at the Digital Cathedral. Have a good week. Listen to the voice that is within. Eat from the tree of life and you'll never be disappointed. God bless.
If your heart has been touched by Don Keithley's words and you believe this ministry can enrich your spiritual journey, we warmly invite you to subscribe and hit the bell icon. By doing so, you'll stay up to date with all the new and inspiring content from the Digital Cathedral, ensuring you never miss out on the transformative power of God's love and grace. You may make a donation at donkeithley.com. We thank you for your continued support and encouragement.